Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody for hosting me here. It's always a delight and an honor to talk a little bit about um, scaling new solutions to homelessness and to the crisis of affordable housing for vulnerable and extremely low income populations more generally. Um, and the first thing I want to say is, although the title says scaling new solutions, all of the components of what we're doing in our partnerships in Los Angeles County and in other places really aren't new. It's the way that they've been combined and the mindset that the different partners in this very collaborative model are bringing. I think that's what's new and I'll hope to get that across to you all today and look forward to dialogue afterwards. So, um, uh, scalable solutions to homelessness and institutionalization. Very briefly, Brilliant Corners was founded in the mid 2000s by a group of service providers uh, particularly interested in creating housing opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities we're California-based. Uh, we have our main hubs in San Francisco and Los Angeles, but we're also active statewide uh, with several other branch offices. Uh, we're a mission-driven supportive housing provider. We don't do any other type of activity or any other type of housing. By that, we mean everybody we're serving uh, needs a combination of fairly intensive supportive services as well as deep income, uh, deep income targeting to achieve affordability for their housing. Uh, like most nonprofits that are in the supportive housing space, we achieve those supportive housing outcomes through a lot of different strategies, including uh, real estate development, property management, and housing services. But primarily what we're going to focus on here today is the housing services side of things and the way that it dovetails with other development activity. And people often think of housing services, they think of services delivered on site, maybe in a multifamily affordable housing complex. We're going to talk about housing services in a scattered site model that's active, leveraging a range of existing and planned housing resources, and not just on site in buildings wholly dedicated to supportive housing. So before talking a little bit about these so-called innovations uh, associated primarily with LA County's flexible housing subsidy pool, let's talk a little bit about the status quo. And I have to apologize, uh, or at least give a caution. Uh, I'm, framing these things in a way to almost be provocative, uh, but by no means am I suggesting that the many things that we're all doing in all of our communities, in our continuums of care, in our coordinated entry systems, aren't achieving incredible outcomes. But we do know that there are serious challenges to scaling our supportive housing solutions and our solutions to end homelessness to meet the need. So current strategies to end homelessness, as you all know, basically look like this. You have shelters. Uh, you also have places called maybe navigation centers, which are sort of an iteration of the shelter model. Um, but the challenge is that a shelter, while getting somebody off the streets and safe from the elements at least some of the uh, hours of the day, is not a home. And even if we call a shelter a navigation center, at least in our experience, it's very difficult to find a place to navigate somebody to. You have to have a housing exit. Supportive housing development, permanent supportive housing, CSH and other groups have led the nation and led HUD to adopt housing first and embrace supportive housing as the best practice model, not only for people experiencing homelessness, but for people exiting uh, criminal justice system, people with mental health and chronic medical conditions, a whole range of populations that can be best served in the supportive housing model. But just to give San Francisco as an example, it probably takes three to six years three in the best of circumstances, to develop a supportive housing multifamily property. And the cost per unit for a studio or one bedroom is approaching $700,000. So I would not be here. My background is, is as a LIHTC and HUD developer, and Brilliant Corners does development, and we work with the entire development community in Los Angeles County. We are not here to say, don't do more permanent supportive housing development. But we are here to say, you won't get to the end goal of ending homelessness and reaching functional or effective zero, just through real estate development strategies. And last but not least, of course, we know how to do supportive services. We know how to do intensive case management, clinical case management, and we can assess and develop service plans for people. I think our systems are quite skilled at that. But if the services are there and the housing isn't there, we're still treading water. And 
our service systems are struggling to access housing. A little bit more on what we sometimes at Brewing Corners call broken systems because one thing we say internally, we don't always say it in public like this, is that we don't think, we're, we don't think our job is to fix broken people. We, we don't think people experiencing homelessness are to blame for being homeless. We think that our systems are broken or at least severely challenged. And I think we're all familiar with some of the ways in which our systems are challenged. And all of this is sort of, for many people I hope, very familiar insider jargon. We have siloed systems. We have systems that have great difficulty talking to each other because they're so complex to run, let alone to coordinate across systems. Criminal justice, adult and aging services, child welfare, uh, uh, developmental services, uh, homeless response system. It goes on and on. And that's before you even add in that, for example, in a place like LA, you have a gigantic county that could be a country. It has 88 cities. Those cities have these different departments and agencies in addition to the county level and the federal and the state. Think about the complexity. So of course we have silos. And we have programs that have been created going back as far as maybe the 1937 Housing Act, if I'm not mistaken, and we've layered on top of that for decades. So we have a lot of complexity, a lot of silos. We definitely have a problem of insufficient funding and really underlying that, we think, a scarcity mindset. A mindset that says we have to do more with less, take it or leave it, maybe the nonprofit staff will work 24 hours a day to solve these very complex social problems. We like to say that we're gonna to need to move from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. In addition to insufficient funding, we have inflexible funding. We have uh, program after program in our communities that have very rigid rules that almost read like a chapter out of Levit Leviticus in the Old Testament. Uh, thou shalt not spend this dollar on this and thou shalt spend the dollar on that. And it's very, very rigid and makes it very difficult for nonprofits in the field to achieve outcomes. We have a set of values and best practices that we call Housing First that HUD has adopted and that most of our communities have now adopted. It's a great set of values and practices, but where's the housing? And last but not least, as I said earlier, we have permanent supportive housing. We know it works, but we can never scale it to the need. And we can't build a building in the time frame that's needed to help a family or a transition age youth or a chronically homeless veteran to get housing when they need it, which is basically now. This this is what our current homeless response systems look like in many ways, or this is how certainly people trying to access housing experience it. And you've probably heard these buzzwords, right? The wrong door problem. Where do you walk in to find the right place, the right waiting list? You don't really want to be on a waiting list, you want to be in a house, but where do you go? What agency? What department? The wrong pocket problem. What's the wrong pocket problem? Well, the systems that are charged with providing supportive services for people experiencing homelessness or creating housing stock with deep affordability targeting may not be the systems that are gonna save money. The money might be saved in the criminal justice system or in uh, uh, emergency interventions, emergency rooms, hospital systems. The biggest problem we really have is that we have multiple programs and one of my colleagues will sometimes say we have a lot of boutique programs, right? They're custom designed by government or by a nonprofit to just do one thing but there's a lot of replication, a lot of duplication, a lot of inefficiency, and frankly, competition for scarce housing resources with no centralized approach, right? And we see this even inside of companies, including Brilliant Corners. We can have two housing coordinators or two case managers sitting side by side, working on uh, housing outcomes, but with different programs, different funding resources, different rules. One's uh, funded by the VA, the other one's funded by the developmental service sector differentially resourced with rules that often seem very arbitrary when the end goal is the same, get an apartment. So there's hope. Uh, <laughs> I remember somebody saying um, that hope is belief in a future outcome over which you have no agency. I think we have more than hope. We have proof of concept. We have some data to show that we have some strategies that work. Uh, but before we talk about those strategies, one more thing. I think there's some, probably there are more than three, but I'm, identified three myths, and I kind of do the Uber test. I ask every Uber driver what they think about homelessness in their community. 
Myth number one, there isn't enough housing out there. I mean, we've got to build. We've got to build mil millions of units. Uh, the National Low Income Housing Group said, I think we need, what, 7.2 million units at extremely low income levels, and I'm sure we do. So there's not enough housing out there, right? We can't, we can't do this. Uh, how many, uh, how, what percentage of San Francisco's existing housing stock do folks in this room think would be required to end homelessness in San Francisco? And let's just say there's between seven and 8,000 people on any given night. Anybody wanna guess what percentage of the existing already built housing stock in San Francisco would be needed to house every single person? Anybody? Guess on the percentage? We think it's less than 1%. Less than 1%. So it, we think it's a myth that the housing isn't out there. Myth number two, and it certainly costs too much, right? Well, let's look at San Francisco again. And we know different communities have different financial resources and different challenges, things that they have to do with their money, their budget choices. But what percentage of San Francisco's municipal budget, these are estimates, might be needed to take every single individual, get them a rent subsidy, get them some wraparound services, uh, ongoing tenancy supports, and keep them stably housed. Anybody want to guess what percent of the San Francisco municipal budget for about seven to 8,000 people? Any takers? No. Again, we think about 1%. So the problem is not a shortage of money. Last myth, and I think this is the most challenging one, and every Uber driver virtually that I've ever asked for the last five years <laughs> has asked me as right at the beginning of the conversation, don't these people, they're not ready for housing or they don't want to be housed. It's sort of the Grizzly, grizzly Adams face of homelessness. Uh, there's somebody out there who really doesn't want to be housed. Why are we spending um, taxpayer dollars to try to house them? These are Ballpark figures, I was a little rushed putting together a presentation, to be honest, but certainly every study that I've seen across lots of different supportive housing programs and interventions reports something between 85 and 98 percent housing retention rates. At various points in time, six months, 12 months, 18 months, once a person who's experienced homelessness or a family that's experienced homelessness homelessness gets rehoused, especially if they have the right ongoing supports, they tend to stay housed. And the 98% statistic is, comes from one of our 80 case management partners in Los Angeles County, a fantastic group called Housing Works. Um, I highly recommend you check out their website. Don't confuse them with Housing Works in New York City. And that 98% figure is for people who were chronically homeless. It's really quite remarkable, but it does bust the myth that people don't want to be housed or aren't ready to be housed. So with all of that preamble, the Brilliant Corners approach, and again, uh, I would really be remiss. I think it probably I need to change this slide. It's really not the Brilliant Corners approach. We're extremely proud as an implementing partner in programs like the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool, but there's absolutely no question that it's been a cross-sector, multi-year community effort to design a program that can scale like the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool. So where did it all start? 2008, I had a staff of, I think, three or four people. I had just been hired. I knew how to develop buildings. I had no idea what housing services even was. I didn't know anything about continuum of care or CES or VI SPDAT. But there was an RFP from the San Francisco Department of Public Health. And it said, here was the title of the program. Uh, scattered site supportive housing and rent subsidy administration. And I went to the orientation and I expected to see all the heavy hitters from the housing world that I knew. And of course they weren't there because they build buildings. They don't do scattered site supportive housing and rent subsidy administration. So I gathered my small team around the table and I said, you know, I don't really know what this is, but I think I can help get the grant if you guys can figure out how to implement it. And the aha moment that we had was we started to think, what would our staffing model be? And we said, you wouldn't ask a realtor to do social work. So why would you ask a social worker to do housing? And that it, was, it was a very important aha moment. It meant that we hired one person with some leasing experience and a real estate license. We've since moved away from that. It's really about a customer service mindset, 
and some basic business jobs, but we didn't staff that function and we still don't to this day with social workers. And we separate the duties internally. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. From there, we began with that program, we did get that contract, and we started to get other contracts to do similar, what we simply called housing services programs, but scattered site supportive housing and rent subsidy administration. And we began to ask ourselves, what are all the tools we need? What are all the resources we need? Staff resources, business systems, uh, tools to engage landlords. What do we need to open up the existing private housing market, whether nonprofit owned, affordable, market rate, for profit, whatever? Get people access into the housing that they don't have access to. And so the basics that we knew needed to be fully resourced were landlord engagement both staffing resources and financial resources and legal tool resources. Rent subsidy administration. That meant we had to build out some back office functions that government contracts often won't pay for. Here's your 10% admin rate, but you're gonna administer thousands of rent subsidies. No, we're gonna need that funded. Tenancy supports, and we, the aha moment was for us, tenancy supports meant housing coordinators and supervisory housing coordinators who were in addition to and separate from case management or care coordination, a separate function with dedicated boots on the ground focused on housing. Now we're finally at what you really want to hear about, the flexible housing subsidy pool in LA, uh, otherwise known as FHSP or the flex pool. Uh, it is a partnership between LA County Department of Health Services, which I believe is between a six and seven billion dollar system with hospitals and clinics and lots of other stuff going on. Um, the flex pool um, is a drop in the bucket, as large as it is in their budget. Uh, nonprofit, community-based operator, that's Brilliant Corners. Uh, property owners and intensive case management service providers across LA County, I'm guessing at least 300. Uh, 80, over 80 intensive case management service partners that we work with on a daily basis in team structures, uh, cross-disciplinary and interagency team structures, and then property owners, including owners of existing built property, as well as developers. Uh, and that is the flex pool. Flex pool goals were ambitious from day one. Uh, and I think ambitious before they knew exactly how they were going to get there. Create 10,000 units of housing rapidly. Uh, our initial contract for four years uh, with renewals to take us through 15 years, um, our target was 2,400 units. Uh, and we, we were able to do about 3,000. Reduce inappropriate use of healthcare services, very expensive services. Uh, improve health outcomes for vulnerable populations, starting with, but not limited to, LA County Department of Health Services patients. And then make a major contribution to ending homelessness in LA, where you're between 50 and 60,000 people on any given night experiencing homelessness, most unsheltered. How do we operationalize the flexible housing subsidy pool? And I like to think that we're operationalizing the values of housing first. Um, instead of just saying that we believe we shouldn't put up barriers before a person experiencing homelessness can access housing, like they have to be clean and sober, those types of barriers, this takes it the next step further. What kind of tools and resources are needed to actually make the housing available? So. We have a housing acquisitions team. Those are the people I told you about that may or may not have a real estate background, but they have a business orientation. They're excellent at customer service. They know how to follow through and build and maintain landlord relationships. Uh, small group, and they're dedicated to, as we say, picking up units and maintaining long-term landlord relationships. And many nonprofits in your, in your county probably already do this work. Rent subsidy administration, move-in payments, and other types of urgent financial transactions, as well as administrative processes, we just call that operations. Uh, we could not succeed in our role if those activities were not funded. They're not carved out of our administrative fee. They are considered by LA County to be part of our direct services administering the flex pool. Property-related tenant services is LA County's name for what we simply call housing services or tenancy supports. That's our core frontline staff, housing coordinators and supervisory housing coordinators who work in teams coordinating intensively with both the county staff and our case management partners. They have a very high one to 75 
case ratio, I think we started at one to 100 and we were able to ratchet it back a little bit. We're able to be that high because they're not case managers. They're not doing the full scope of social work. They are extra eyes, ears, minds, boots on the ground, problem solvers, focused on, you might call it housing case management, although that risks confusion. But they're working with the third party folks that you see in the green quadrant there, intensive case management service providers. They've got a very healthy one to 20 ratio. It does vary depending on the type, uh, you know, the acuity level and the type of sub uh, population, if you will, that we serve in the flex pool. Um, financial and legal tools, and I'll add something that really should be on this slide, uh, procurement and contract innovation or reform, also very critical. So I'll try to remember that, although I don't have prompts up there. Uh, we wanted to think of solutions to every barrier to rapidly accessing housing for somebody in an urgent situation, whether on the streets, in a shelter, coming out of criminal justice or some other system, jail, health, prison, mental health, you name it. What are those barriers? We needed security deposits, and we needed to know they were there. We needed to be able to, when we found a landlord willing to let us take and control one or more units in their buildings or in their plan development, we needed an agreement that would hold those units so that as we had program participants, we didn't have to start looking for the housing while the person was on the streets. We have an inventory and we start matching people to the housing and they pick what works for them. So we needed unit holding agreements and we needed the dollars to hold vacant units. Of course, we needed rent subsidies and those had to be flexible. Although we work with Section 8 whenever it's available, the flex pool innovation includes being able to pay more than FMRs. If, if it's a dollar more than FMR, should the person stay homeless? It doesn't make sense. We manage to an average and try to stay around FMR, but it's not as rigid as a, as a federal program, right? Furniture and household goods. Landlord incentives like signing bonuses. Flexibility. When we have a Section 8 voucher instead of a flex pool voucher, we sometimes triple the signing bonus as an incentive to the landlord because the landlord's like, well, why, why do I want to deal with the housing authority, which is difficult, rule bound, slower maybe, when I can have your flex subsidy. So we level that playing field to get voucher utilization up. Flexible funding for past due rents, damage mitigation funds, everything that's needed to get a person housed and keep them housed. Now, legal instruments, I'll say just a word about that. We have a customizable suite vacant unit agreements, rent subsidy agreements, master rent subsidy agreements, program participant agreements. We adapt those on the fly. We've got one tool that we use with LIHTC developers who tend to be able to handle a 40-page document. In fact, they want it. And then there's mom and pop landlords, and we don't want to leave those units out there. They can't handle a 40-page document that the LIHTC lawyers can. So we have different versions of the agreements, and we're always customizing them for different purposes but they're ready, everybody knows how to use them. They're now a recognized tool in LA. So I mentioned procurement reform. This is a uh, favorite theme of my chief program officer, Danielle Wildcrest. Some of you have had the opportunity to meet her, um, a real leader in this field. Um, procurement reform should not be left out of the equation for why this is working. We have a 15-year contract, as I mentioned. I don't know if there are nonprofit folks out there, but it's pretty rare, right? You get year-to-year -year contracts, you're living on a thin margin, you don't even know if you're gonna get renewed. Uh, we had a time horizon with really ambitious goals for unit acquisition and getting people into housing, but we had a time horizon to succeed and to build capacity and strength. Simply the decision to centralize the housing function with us rather than say, well, we're gonna have to be fair, 50 companies are gonna do a piece of this work. I'm not saying that couldn't work, but it was a bold decision. Uh, here's the one that is a shocker. Uh, the flexible housing subsidy pool is currently at about a $200 million annual budget, and that's just Brilliant Corners budget. That does not count the costs for the county staff or for um, the third party intensive case management providers. 100% of the program costs are advanced on a rolling basis. 100% of the program costs are advanced. There are very few nonprofits, if any, in the country that could advance a $6 million rent roll and the constantly growing program costs and not end up focusing on their cash flow instead of the outcomes. 
I think this is a revolutionary and daring move. I think it can be done consistent with good stewardship of public funds. Um, we know where every dollar is and so does the county at all times. Uh, so that's just a handful of the procurement reforms. There are others. Uh, this is another little Danielle Wildcrest special. Uh, we often get questions, well, do you guys do, uh, you know, do you do single units or are you doing master leasing of whole buildings? Yes. I mean, are you guys focused on the market rate housing or are you working with the affordable housing developers? Yes. Are you doing permanent housing or interim and bridge housing? Yes. The housing resources that we're able to procure, it's all of the above through one relatively streamlined structure. Uh, the model of yes, populations. People will say, well, are you doing uh, single adults experiencing homelessness or families? The answer is yes, although in that case, we, we don't do too much with families. There, there are some exceptions. Uh, are you doing adults or transition age youth? The answer is yes. The housing platform that we call the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool, with a similar platform launching in San Francisco, can serve all of these different populations. Uh, veterans, uh, justice-involved people, uh, frequent uh, utilizers of public health systems, any uh, extremely vulnerable population that you can think of that needs that combination of deep affordability and supports. And the last of these model of yes uh, pieces here, subsidy types. Are you working with local subsidies or federal subsidies like Section 8 and VASH? Yes, all the above. Are you working with short-term or long-term rent subsidies? Yes, all the above. And we're experimenting with shallow subsidies. So most of the time we're doing deep subsidies, but we've also got rapid rehousing programs that involve a gradual assumption of the rent or a greater portion of the rent by the program participant as they're able. Uh, so that's, again, maybe could live under the word flexibility. It could also live under the idea of, of, of reform, procurement reform, because so many of our programs, for no good reason really, are designed to only do one of these things, one very specifically defined population, one very specific set of things you can do with the money or can't do with the money. A lot of these programs are overthought and don't work as well as we hope they would. So remember the crazy quilt, you know, what many of our systems or aspects of our systems look like. This is what we think programs like the Flexible Housing Subsidy Pool or the San Francisco Housing Platform that we're just launching now can do to try to iron out some of that uh, craziness. All of those systems, potentially, can be partners, can buy into the same infrastructure for accessing existing and planned housing and providing the rent subsidies, the tenancy supports, and the case management services that can work for all the populations served by all of those systems. So it sounds good. But does it work? This is the trajectory of growth that the flexible housing subsidy pool is experiencing. Uh, we're currently at about 6,000 units. Uh, we are headed towards 10,000 units. Um, I think that there's definitely an, a body of evidence there. There's some studies that look at cost savings and other things, but I think this is the key, that there are units out there and there are people who the general public might not think can be housed or want to be housed that are living in those 6,000 units as we speak. So that's the story of the flexible housing subsidy pool. Um, and we think that uh, when you think about the fact that we're currently securing about 200 apartment units per month in LA with a similar, similar number of move-ins, right? So there's always vacant units and folks are moving in. So the numbers disconnect a little bit, but about 200 a month with all of our partners. Now apply that math and imagine what could happen in your tri-county area if you were to even come close to 200 a month through a new intervention or an improvement to the interventions you're already doing. So with that, I'll, uh, open it up or look forward to the panel discussions, but thank you for listening and uh, appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about it.